We'll get some straight answers for our next session, which is the future of technology and innovation, friend or foe. And to moderate it, it's my pleasure to introduce a member of the Babson College Board of Trustees and Executive Leadership Council, who's also Ernst & Young's global client service partner for major multinational consumer product accounts. So please, a warm welcome, Jeffrey Perry. Good morning. You know, I think that Going back over today and yesterday, it has just been an honor and a privilege to listen to the wisdom and perspectives of the members of the Academy of Distinguished Entrepreneurs who've taken the time to come back and to share their insights with all of us. So I, I, I want to just give another round of applause for so far what we've heard from all of the panelists. So if you think about this panel, the last one was about the real story in terms of um, building businesses. But this panel is about the future and, and going forward. And as we know, technology advancements have changed the world over the past century. And as we heard from some of the earlier panelists, whether it's the badge that Peter talked about, the, um, the fact that John said you need to be ready for change, or the fact that Eric said that his business, although a manufacturing business, is an innovation business, we know that the pace of change has significantly accelerated and it has disrupted every single industry. It's impacted how we live, how we eat, how we work, how we play, how we stay healthy. So what we're gonna do now is look forward in terms of how can technology, along with innovation, help entrepreneurial leaders create economic and social value. So I'm pleased to introduce um, our panelists. And as I call them up to the stage, I'd also like to share one of their favorite quotes, just to mix things up a little bit. So starting with the Honorable Craig Benson, inducted into the Academy in 1995, Craig serves as the CEO at Softdraw Investments, and he previously served as the 79th governor of the state of New Hampshire. Craig? Have a seat. Have a seat. Good seat. And Craig's favorite quote, being a New Hampshire patriot, he says he has the coolest uh, quote and motto of the world, uh, live free or die, of course. <laughs> Next we have Bob Davis, inducted into the Academy in 2001. Bob is a general partner at Highland Capital Partners, focusing on disruptive commerce, software, and autonomy. Previously, Bob was founder, president, and CEO of Lycos, an early search engine. And Bob's favorite quote is, you let up, you lose. Bob? <laughs> Next we have Dr. Desh Despondi. Inducted into the Academy in 2012, Desh is a trustee of the Despondi Foundation. He's also president and chairman of Sparta Group, a family investment office, and chairman of Tejas Networks. His quote is, simple things are hard to do, Hard things are impossible to do. Unless you boil down what you want to something simple, don't even try. Desh? Thank you. And last, and certainly not least, if some of you who were with us yesterday were inspired by Diane von Furstenberg's presentation and the fact that she was the first woman inducted into the Academy of Distinguished Entrepreneurs in 1979, I am thrilled to introduce Diane Hessen, adding gender diversity to our panel and significant insights. Diane was inducted into the Academy in 2014, and she is founder and chairman of C-Space, which in 2000 was the first to build online communities for market research. She currently is also uh, the head of Salient Ventures that helps the next generation of tech companies grow. Diane? Yeah. And Diane's favorite quote is the entrepreneurial's creed. I started with nothing, and I have most of it left, okay? And in case you're interested, my favorite quote is, without a struggle, there is no progress, first said by Frederick Douglass. So let's get started with the panel. Want to have a seat? Okay. So one of the things that I wanted to start off with was the fact that um, many of you have started technology business and you were the first to do it. So Bob, I'll start with you. What are your thoughts on why is it important to innovate and invest in emerging technologies? 
Well, it, it's the future. Uh, emerging technologies and people that you put around them are the future makers that make for a different, better, varied world that we have for ourselves. So I, I can't imagine uh, a day today. I mean, if people hadn't been innovating 40 years ago, there'd be no internet today. They, w the, many of the technologies and the solutions that we have just wouldn't exist. So um, it, it just makes for a better world. Diane, you did the same with your, with your business. What, what are your thoughts? You know, um, you know, there's a saying in business that um, I can give it to you better, faster, or cheaper. Pick two. Uh, which is always very comforting, because maybe somebody makes something better and faster, but it's really expensive, so you can still win. Um, the great thing about a new technology, especially when you've got the timing right, uh, is that you can get better and faster and cheaper. And that's what disruption is all about. So you think about businesses today. You hear some echoing here? Um, you think about businesses today that are really, really disruptive. I mean, just take, I don't know, Uber. Right? I mean, you can basically get a faster pickup very likely in a better car if you want it for less money than you've ever gotten it before. And so that's done through the power of technology, but being able to get all three is just irresistible when you're sitting in front of a customer. Right, right. Craig, let me turn to you. So we, we talk about technology advances, so we hear a lot about artificial intelligence, um, automation, robotics. Uh, in fact, we at EY work with a lot of our customers and clients in terms of taking them into the future and understanding the implications of technology so that they can actually navigate the disruption or to become a disruptor. Um, so from your perspective, does it create opportunities for folks or does it create more vulnerabilities? What's your perspective well, on that? I, I think both. I mean, technology, new technology generally creates more opportunity as a result of developing that technology. It was my networking business. We built networks and then security need, was needed on top of that because the networks became pervasive and people needed a way to secure what they were doing on the networks and so on and so forth. So our technology enabled a whole new generation of technology. You mentioned artificial intelligence. Okay, so we've needed to develop that because there's so much information that's been created Somebody's got to be able to facilitate the use of that in a, in a meaningful way. So the cool thing about technology, it generally spawns more stuff and, and more business opportunities and more opportunities to, to think differently. So in your businesses, did you embrace that change or was it a, de a desire to, to hold on what you had as you, you know, thought about the implications? The best I was in business was when I was betting my business every single time. When you get to a place where you're afraid to lose what you have, you stop being as good as you used to be. And so I know when, when my back was against the wall, it happened a lot, and we were forced to decide whether we keep our business the same or bet it all. Betting it all made us sharper and better every single time. When we started to get more safe, we started to be less risk-taking, and it created for us opportunities for other people to jump into those spaces that we could have been in. Great. Desh, what, what do you think? Friend or foe? Opportunity Well, or? you know, I, th I think there's no stopping of technology innovation. I've been on the board of MIT now for about 20 years. And, and there's two things that are happening. Number one, it's amazing what's going on in each one of these segments, whether it's AI or nanotech or biotech, genome, but also they all play on each other. And secondly, because of the connected world, both collaboration and competition are really exhilarating all of this. So I think it's, there's no escaping of the fact that it's gonna get more and more and more powerful and you're gonna have a more powerful tool. So the real question is, how do you use that to really impact the world? You know, pi piling on from where I was a minute ago, I, I read a great book, many of you may have read it a while back, called Enlightenment Now by Stephen Pinker over at Harvard. And it really talks about the state of the human condition today being, despite the challenges that we have, being better than any time in human history. Of all the things that used to be kind of nasty out there, famine, plague, health, all the issues that would do destroy civilizations, and technology in one form or another is what's advanced that cause. I mean, I mean just picture the lives that all of us live today compared to just a hundred years ago. I mean, it's just infinitely more comfortable and safe for anything that we've seen, and technology is a driver of all of that. 
Well, Bob, another perspective that you shared earlier was that um, there are a lot of technologies that not only create different situations for low-level tasks and low-level work, like we think of retail kiosks or, or whatnot, but you had stressed that there are also like very high-level and skilled work that may be um, at risk as well. Would you share to expand upon well, that? Well, I, I think so. I mean, back to other books. I'm reading a great book now by, called Homo Deus that it just really talks about the future of mankind as opposed to looking back. And, and one of the things that it gets into in some great detail, which I agree with, is is as we start to look at artificial intelligence and what that brings to bear. I mean, we already see what robotics has done, and I think it's clearly been, as far as industrialization, it's been strong, it's been powerful, it's been good. But as AI really takes over, I mean, what are the jobs that can be replaced? I mean, we already see things with Uber, and at some point that car will be driverless. Uh, I don't know if that will be in five years or 20 years, but it will happen for sure. Uh, we see medical robotics today, but are we that far off before, be, before the the robotics performs the entire surgery itself where the doctor is not necessary to stand there. We understand that a doc, we go to medical school for, I don't know, 12 years by the time we're finally certified as a fellow and to diagnose things. And what is it about a computer that can't make a better decision quicker, and more effectively, and more accurately than we find today? So I think we're going to find really uh, one of the challenges we'll find, my guess is not in my lifetime, but certainly during the course of the century that we're going to find for ourselves is, is not just lower level, low wage jobs, but really highly skilled jobs that are at risk because of what technology uh, can, can do. And there'll be displacement that I can't begin to understand how that will be tackled. I suspect because I believe in the, the genius of mankind, we'll find a way around that and we'll find a way into full employment, but a lot of what we know today will be performed by machines, not by people. Do you think that that evolution is something that many organizations or entrepreneurs have an opportunity to be proactive in terms of making a difference, or you just have to be aware of the environment to, to react quickly? Oh, I think it's a freight train that there's no stopping it. You either get on board or you get run over in terms of the way that happens. So if you look at entrepreneurs, I think they're embracing it in a big way. And, and many of the people that we back in our venture fund are the ones that are offering that level of innovation. And I, I uh, we invested in a driverless uh, software for driverless cars. Um, not too long ago from a couple of brilliant scientists that had put this together out of MIT, and they've, they've since sold the company, but you know, that part of that, that next generation. So again, is that friend or foe? I mean, I guess if I'm an Uber driver, I'd probably say that's foe over time. Mm -hmm. But if I'm uh, the rest of us trying to be in a mobile world, I, I think it's friend. Dan, do you have any additional thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I, I think that um, ideas are sometimes overrated for entrepreneurs. I mean, I've, I've got a million ideas that I've never implemented. And, you know, the great entrepreneurs... You share those with me? I'd like a couple. Yeah, I actually... Well, the funny thing is, I've shared a lot of my ideas, but, you know, they're mine. And if I tell it to somebody else, they maybe aren't as excited about it as I am. So there, it's always weird doing that. But, you know, um, I think sometimes you do get inertia on the part of organizations where you have something that might replace the job of the person who you're calling on. Mm -hmm. And you can get years and years of resistance there. I know in our business, we were trying to completely disrupt um, big elements of the market research space. And the tricky thing was that our buyers were researchers. So I'd go to conferences and people would stand up in the middle of the conference and scream, you guys are frauds, this is not research, you know, da da da. And of course, <laughs> at that moment, you say, well, what am I gonna do here? Am I just gonna say, the world is not ready for this, we're not gonna try it, or do you just go back? Do you just go to the next conference? And I think it took us two to three years longer to begin to get traction in our business because people who were at fairly high levels would have their jobs disrupted by what we do. I think we see that happening right now in, uh, Bob talked about diagnostics. I have a friend that's got a company that is um, able to detect skin cancer, basic skin cancers, just by taking a photograph. You know, you see something on your arm, you take a photograph, you submit it, and it's a very, very, they can diagnose with a very, very high degree of confidence. The problem is that part of what they need is, this is based on artificial intelligence, they need as many photographs of skin problems 
from the dermatology community as possible. Dermatology community is partially working on it, but they're partially saying, I don't really know if I want to do this because I don't want anybody to displace uh, the judgment and wisdom and brilliance that I have. So I think diagnosis of pictures of your skin in the next five years will be the way most skin cancer is detected. But right now, there's huge resistance, and it takes somebody that's got kind of the commitment and persistence to just keep at it instead right. of saying, you know, it's never going to work. Diane, you use, use a great word when you talk about disruption. And, of course, that's the businesses that I back. And, Craig, I like where you went before. If you're sitting, I'm paraphrasing, but if you're sitting on your laurels, you're in trouble. Yeah. I mean, the entrepreneurs that I'm backing are all looking to change somebody. They're all looking to put somebody out of business. They're all looking to attack an established player. I mean, we do a lot of deep enterprise technology that I won't get into today, but a lot of consumer stuff I look at. We had a company we, we just sold recently called Harry's that does men's shaving products. And who would think you could ever tackle Gillette? I mean, the established incumbent, 85% market share. And here are these young entrepreneurs that come along and create a company that they sell uh, for, for a couple of years later for a billion and a half dollars. I have a company in the food space, Freshly, four-year-old company, will do $400 million this year in revenue selling ready-made meals cooked out of these massive kitchen facilities that they ship around the continental United States. But from zero to $400 million in four years is mind-boggling. And they, they disrupt all sorts of traditional eating options that we have and what is a trillion-dollar industry that we find in terms of food, broadly speaking. Rent the runway, rent clothing. It's another investment we have, rent clothing instead of selling it. So what does that do to retailers that may have been out there that were on a traditional approach? And all of these things and all of these entrepreneurs are looking for these, these loopholes in the market to say, I see an incumbent that's sitting there a little too slow, that doesn't believe it can be done, and they carve not just a little path, a little trickle, and then it's a just massive flood that lets through, and we have the new uh, players on the street. So, Bob, in that scenario, do you also have requirements for these businesses that you're, you're funding to not only identify those areas of disruption where they can really make a difference, but also to be sustainable over time as opposed to just being able to disrupt and then um, blow up because of not being able to be sustainable businesses. Is that well, a and they're, they're all sustainable over time. If you look now, what I do, many of what the businesses I back don't make it. They, they don't survive, and that's the nature of entrepreneurship. It's risk-taking. It's a lot of failure and disappointment that's part of that journey, but, if, but you know, the, it's the folks that really do it well have the courage to go out and try, and that's what, to me, is most impressive. But many will fail. Some will become uh, sizable companies of a next generation. I mean, Google was a VC-backed company that it's hard to believe, but you know, 20 years ago, Google didn't exist uh, as an entity, and it, it just wasn't there. Facebook didn't exist. All of these things that are so ingrained in our culture weren't there, and they weren't part of it. So the companies that I just kicked off, will, will they all be here years from now? Well, that, that's really an unknowable. It's a question, I think, of, of how they execute, how they perform. Uh, crossing the chasm from a small company to a medium-sized company to a conglomerate is hard work. So it, it's, it's a lot to it. Will they be there? I don't know. I mean, the stat of how many of the S&P from 25 years ago that is still around today is, I don't know the exact number, so I won't quote it, but it's really small. I mean, you have mm -hmm. two-thirds or more are gone. Mm -hmm. They're just gone. And that's the small companies and large companies are always at the risk of that, but it's great execution every day of their lives. Dash, I'd like to turn to you for perspectives on social entrepreneurship. I know that's something that you're very passionate about. Uh, you've talked about, you know, there's a lot of focus on the people in the world with disposable income, but there's a whole other population without disposable income. So what are your thoughts on the ways to leverage technology to improve lives from a social perspective? And it actually came up a little bit in the last panel as well. Right. So, you know, as the world changes faster and faster, the smartest, the boldest, the adventurous, they'll, they'll do well as a group. You know, some may fail, some may not do well. So... But the world will sort of, it also has the risk of splitting the world into people who are automating and people who are being automated. Mm -hmm. So the way I sort of think about this is there's 7 billion people in the world. There's 2 billion people who have disposable income, <clears throat> 5 billion people who don't have disposable income, and they both have problems. And I'm sure some entrepreneurs are very focused on solving the problems with people who have disposable income, which are sort of the, most of the companies we talk about here. Uh, but there's also people who are interested in solving the problems, having an impact on the lives of those five billion people. And, and, the, and, and it tends to be a little bit different. So 
uh, I'm an engineer, so I had to leave you a couple of equations. Uh, so if you want to have, make a difference in the lives of the people who have disposable income, if they have a problem, they're, they're Googling for solutions. And therefore, you have to compete for the opportunity to make a difference in their lives. So you have to bring something new to this world. And so innovation is paramount if you want to make a difference in those lives. So innovation plus relevance is equal to impact, right? And that's what drives the GDP, GNP, the financial markets, everything else. That's the primary thing, the financial market driver. But then when you go to the other part of the world where people are living on almost nothing, $2 a day or, or, or just struggling to get through the day, they're not Googling for solutions. And therefore, if you really want to, have to make a difference in their lives, you really have to turn that equation around and do relevance plus innovation is equal to impact. Meaning, you have to co-create the solution with those people and you have to create capacity within those communities to actually spread those solutions out. Because all the ecosystem that we built in the last 40, 50 years to venture capitalists and angel and public markets and everything else to make a big difference in the people who have disposable income, that ecosystem does not exist for the other part of it. So if you really want to uh, make a difference in their lives, we have, to, we have to start recreating it. And I think it's important. Otherwise, we'll create a very unstable world. And do you find that if you're focusing on people without disposable income, that there's the opportunity to, to leapfrog in terms of technology and how um, people use different things to improve Yeah, it, it's really a, a two punch. You know, first, I think you have to get them entrepreneurial. The way I see it is that you know, some people see a problem and complain. Some see, see a problem and get all excited about it. And it's the entrepreneurs who sort of get all excited about it. But what happens, so, so the only difference between an impoverished community and a vibrant community is a mix of these people, right? So in, in impoverished communities, problems become chronic, they get deadlocked, they become hard to solve. People try a little bit and they cannot solve it. And so they feel victimized, helpless, and they complain. So first you sort of have to slowly start injecting the culture of converting problem complainers into problem solvers. And then once they are sort of ready for it, then you can inject all the different tools, technology, everything else that you have. But a mistake that a lot of us make is that we start with the innovation to bring about a big difference in those communities, and, and that doesn't go anywhere. It makes us all happy because we feel like we're bringing a new solution, but it, it doesn't stick. Yeah. Craig, I'd be interested in your perspective. Is there a role for government in, in this, or is it all private sector? Well, gov government does try and help. Um, in fact, government has a big part. In, in, in my mind, education is the best way out of all this stuff. Now, education, as we packaged it now, is generally through high school in this country, and then two, four, maybe more years of college follow on. So every state has state schools. I was actually addressing community colleges last night in New Hampshire, where they do a great job in a two-year program. Um, but education needs to be broken down into even more smaller bites, if you will. I mean, if you're going to help somebody in a country that doesn't have a lot of infrastructure, they don't have time to take a two-year program. Right. They got you. You got to help them today. And Desh is right. There's maybe one or two entrepreneurs in that community that can start to sow the seeds for everybody else to be able to be brought up, but they need help to get educated on what to do and those people underneath them as well. I mean, the power of this world, as Bob said, over the last 100 years has come from education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've done a lot of things with technology and other stuff, but it all came from education. And we need to empower education for the times that change in, to allow people around the world to, to improve their quality of life and find solutions to make their lives better and those of other people. So government does have a, pro, a place, but I think private industry also has a place as do private individuals. And unfortunately, government is not the fastest to the party. <laughs> and um, they need to become a little bit more entrepreneurial, as, as you know here at Babs and Jeff, because you're involved with it. We're not teaching just entrepreneurs how to start businesses. We're trying to make entrepreneurs difference makers, whether they're in government or nonprofits or whatever field that they happen to be in. You've got to be a difference maker. And if you're a difference maker, 
you will make the places you're connected to much better, much faster, much more efficient. So Diane, one of the things that I was really impressed when I did some background research on you, and it was all great stuff, was that you actually talk to, I believe, five entrepreneurs a week and focus a lot on, on mentoring and uh, really creating the next generation of, of tech leaders. So what is some of the advice that you give to the, the entrepreneurs that you work with and anything that you'd like to share with us today? About, about tech specifically? Or, or, or the, the, the advice for young entrepreneurs. It could be tech or it could be non-tech, but in terms yeah. of getting started. Well, with entrepreneurs in general, I always say like, um, you know, I feel like I had an advantage because I grew up on the wrong side of the tracks. And um, I didn't have a lot growing up, but I had a really happy childhood. So for me, I never really worried about risk. I mean, I just always thought, well, what's the worst thing that happens? The worst thing that happens is I'll end up in Norristown, Pennsylvania, and I'll be a barista, and I'll be fine. I mean, that's my worst case scenario, which what Desh talks about is so true. You know, my worst case scenario, if everything blew up, is still better than most of the people that Desh is talking about. So when I talk to students and they say, well, I'm thinking about, I, I have a job at Goldman Sachs, but I have this other thing that I'm dying to do, and my parents are going to kill me if I do it. But what do you think? And I always just say, well, what's the worst thing that happens? And the worst thing that happens is you build this company and it doesn't work, and then you can go to Goldman Sachs. So um, I, that's the Goldman general. Sachs will still be there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's the general advice I give. You know, I think in terms of technology, um, if you're a tech junkie, you, know, you fall in love with the technology and sometimes you forget that it really is just all about the customer, right? What, what problem is the customer trying to solve? Um, for those of you who live in Boston, there was always this, this there was a huge billboard at Logan Airport um, inside one of the terminals, I guess it was Terminal B, that was up for like a year and it said, you know, like basically our hybrid cloud is better than anybody else's hybrid cloud. So if you know what a hybrid cloud is, that actually is a super cool thing. But I just kept thinking to myself, I would like look around at the people who were going down the escalator where that big billboard was there and I thought, this, this billboard is really a waste of money. Like they're probably one in every 1,000 people going down the escalator cares about the hybrid cloud even knows what it is, although probably 900 out of 1,000 could get benefits from it. So, so much of the risk of, of falling in love with your technology is forgetting that you have to figure out what the so what is and, and what kind of problem it solves for customers. I remember I was, um, somebody called me once when we had gotten to scale and we were buying a lot of other companies and uh, somebody said, you really have to talk to this company. This guy comes in and he says, we're going to disrupt the entire space you're in. And I said, well, why is that? He said, well, we have an evolutionary optimization algorithm. <laughs> and he proceeded for the next half hour to tell me all about this algorithm. And I will tell you, I was completely lost. So he left, and I thought to myself, oh my gosh, those guys are really smart, and I bet they have something really cool. But I couldn't for the life of me figure out what it was. And so I think we do hear that. I look at decks where people are enamored of their technology, and I think, oh, you know, I, I've been in tech for 40 years, and I can't get beyond slide three. Mm -hmm. We always have to be asking, you know, what is the problem that we're solving with this technology, and, and what is it going to leverage, and how is it going to change things? rather than just having the technology in somebody's face where most of the time they go, well, those people were pretty smart, but I'm not sure I'd buy something I don't understand. Right. Bob, what's a nugget of advice that you either give the businesses that you're funding or advice that you'd like to share today with this audience? Uh, it's easy for me, and we, you know, I meet with, I don't know how many hundreds of entrepreneurs a year as part of what we do, two, two things. One, you talked about it before, you let up, you lose. To me, there is no singular trait that's more important in an entrepreneur than perseverance. It's that person that can fall down, stand up, dust herself off, and say, I got this. To me, that's really what it's about because the journey is hard. I mean, life is hard. There are no simple answers. And being out there and being willing to 
just persevere, plow through, make it happen, is to me no singular trait that's, that's more important to really fight the grind. Secondly, uh, I'll tell an entrepreneur, which I believe so deeply, is create magical moments. And we have, every one of us has opportunities all throughout our day, every day, uh, every year, to create these moments of interaction that are special. That other people look at us, at ourselves, our company, and say, wow, that was really great, what they did. The way they treated me as a customer, the way they treated me as an employee, the way they treated me as a friend uh, was different and, and unique. And they listened, they paid attention, they helped, they advised, any of it. And we all have these opportunities to create uh, magical moments. And I, I advise that to my entrepreneurs, to my kids, to my friends across the board. It, it's, a, it's a real standout. Desh, what about you? What advice would you give? Well, you know, it, it's just a, a fantastic journey because every year you look back and you say, I didn't know I could do this. And, and that thrill, you know, ability to wake up in the morning and being excited about the day, independent of what the problems are, is probably the biggest gift any entrepreneur has. And, and, and entrepreneurs, you know, I think those who are really, like Diane was saying, latched onto the impact as opposed to a technology or something like that, are, are the ones. And, and now I'm seeing a lot of younger people very excited about having that big impact. Mm -hmm. You know, rich people don't have those many interesting problems anymore. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so really <laughs> focusing on like big problems in the world and going after them, it's amazing how excited people are. And Craig, I'll close with you. So I, I, I teach a class here at Babson, an entrepreneurship class. And I think the thing that I find with my students is they take a lot of time really thinking through what they want to do, but they don't pull the trigger. And you got to get in the game. And I know when I got in the game, I'm sure everybody up here, including me, the game is different than what you think it's going to be. And once you get in the game, you start to realize, oh my gosh, it does this, not that, and so on and so forth. So until you really understand the game, you can not understand what you need to do perfectly. And so it's time to get in the game, make things happen. As Bob says, you got to get knocked down and get back up a lot. And you got to get used to the word no. And one of my biggest motivators in the years that I found in my business was all the people that told me I couldn't do it. I wanted to prove them wrong in the worst way. And so um, that was my motivation to keep going and going and going in spite of some tough times and difficulties. I didn't want to give up. And too many people that get in as entrepreneurs don't have that fortitude to keep going in spite of bad news, multiple no's, mm. the rain's coming through the roof, whatever the problem is, and, and dealing with it. So it's, uh, it's fun being an entrepreneur when it's fun, but it sucks when it's not fun. <laughs> right, right. And so, Dan, you had an additional thought? I, just, I, I think this advice is so great. And you know, we, especially in the US, we've come to really glamorize entrepreneurship. You know, it's like, I say to people sometimes, close your eyes and picture an entrepreneur. And many people do that, and you think about a young guy with a hoodie in his Harvard dorm, and he builds something, and he tries to get money here. It doesn't work, but he goes to California, he raises a bunch of money, it all works. He builds a multi-zillion dollar company, he meets a gorgeous woman, and that's that's the entrepreneurial journey. It's just like Mark Zuckerberg. And I will tell you that that's not, it's not the journey that we have been through. <laughs> it's not the journey that so many people in this room have been through. Well, other than um, the part that I married the gorgeous woman. I other than the gorgeous <laughs> woman. But you know, I just, uh, <laughs> I think our tough time, your tough times build your character. Yeah. They really do in, in life and, and certainly in the entrepreneurial journey. You know, I, I say that in Boston, you know, what would June be without February? You know, it, as we all, you sit in Fenway Park in July and you go, gosh, I made it. And um, it's so much sweeter that way. So I think the journey with its ups and downs is so much more gratifying when it's difficult. But, you know, we do tend to kind of glamorize yeah. it and forget about how many times you're just lying there at 3 o'clock in the morning saying it's never going to work. Right. Well, I really appreciate you all sharing your insights and a specific message that I want to give to the, the, to the students in the audience. I hope you recognize what a gift it is to 
hear these perspectives, the ups and downs, the challenges, the grit that's required in order to be successful, and the fact that uh, uh, the panelists took the time to share their insights and perspectives with us. So I want to thank you again. And thank you for listening. All right. That's great. Big round of applause for Jeff Perry as well, too, please. Thank you. Well done.